Greetings, my fellow freedom lovers, sovereign thinkers. This is LL3's newest podcast. My name is Craig, transmitting from the beautiful Beehive State, which is known as the state of Utah. And today's date, Tuesday, September 8th, 2015. And actually on the East Coast, it will be the 9th, early Wednesday morning to be exact. Yep, I'm still in Roy City, Utah, which is half hour north of Salt Lake City. Yeah, it's getting a little chilly out here, you know, for the summer. It's like 65. <laughs> you know, people down in Florida are like, You effing B-S-S-O-B, how dare you say it's 65 degrees down up there? And they're all like sweating their tails off down there, even at night. And it's okay. Hopefully everyone's doing well down there in the beautiful swampy mangroves of Florida and beyond to all everyone out there worldwide. Yeah, I'm gonna it'll be pretty short today, so I'm not gonna go too crazy on the hype and the hoopla and the trends to be very sincere, except for maybe a couple of topics. But um Yeah, it's like everyone's like talking about the whole like uh big thing about the ref Syrian refugees and other war-torn areas going to Europe and so forth, and possibly the western United States, probably western part, like, uh, in the U.S., Canada, supposedly. And people are really talking about they can be um, inform- operatives or sleeper cells with the group ISIS, which I will say... And not afraid to address that. They're just New World Order funded. And they're not true Muslims. They are not Muslims at all. Just jack lanterns that wants to use the Islamophobia on to the people of the world. And this is really disturbing because what's going on over there, there's some cases about protesting and they're throwing feasts at innocent people, even around Europe. And they're in the Muslim ghettos. You know, it's really shame. This is part of the Club of Rome agenda. That's all I had need to say. One world order, new world order platform. So, but that's I'm just going to make it pretty brief because everyone's talking about it. I know I've made some, uh, dressed some stories in the past episodes you could check out however we're going to be um, just saying it's not going to be too long mostly you know something to think about and so forth and this one here came from the 10th amendment center and this one's entitled to the governor's desk to california bills to protect privacy against warrantless surveillance and it can and it says here came out today the California Assembly gave final approval to a bill that will protect electronic privacy against warrantless intrusion. Send it to Governor Brown's desk for signature. It works in injunction with the second bill passed last week to help end bulk spying by stingrays. If ultimately signed to law, these bills will not only help protect privacy in California, but would also hinder part of the federal surveillance state. Senator Mark Leno, Democrat, and Senator Joel Anderson, Republican, introduced Senate Bill 178, which is a link for that. The California Electronic Communications Privacy Act in February. Titled as a major electronic data privacy act, the bill will prohibit government entities from compelling the production or of access to electronic communication information or electronic device information and bar them from obtaining electronic device information by means of of physical interaction or electronic communication with the electronic device without search warrant or wiretap order and order for electronic reader's records or pursuant to a subpoena issued pursuant to existing state law providing that the information is not sought for the purpose of investigating or prosecuting a criminal offense with only a few exceptions. SB 178 passed the Assembly today by a vote of 55 to 11. It must now go to the Senate 
for concurrence with the amendments. If the Senate accepts the Assembly changes, the bill will go to the governor's desk. If not, a conference committee will try to hammer out the differences. The legislation would also require enforcement to obtain a warrant, a wiretap order, and an order for their electronic reader, write reader records, or a subpoena before compelling any person other than the owner of the device to produce electronic information. This specifically includes third-party providers. Pastor will also help block the use of cell site simulators, known as stingrays. These devices essentially spoof cell phone towers, tricking any device within a range into connecting to the stingray instead of the tower, allowing law enforcement to sweep up communications content, as well as locate it and track the person in the possession of a specific phone or other electronic device. SB 178 would require a warrant, wiretap order, or an order for e-reader records before police could deploy these devices under most circumstances. SB 178 does not include an exception to the warrant requirement. If the government entity in good faith believes that an emergency involving danger of a death or a seriously, serious physical injury to any person requires access to electronic device information, it also allows access to information or to locate a lost or stolen device and with the specific consent of the owner of the device. Under the proposed law, a service provider may voluntarily disclose electronic communications information or subscriber information when that disclosure is not otherwise prohibited by state or federal law. If a government entity receives electronic communication information voluntarily provided pursuant to the subdivision, it must destroy that information within 90 days absent a court order or specific consent of the sender of recipient of information. Legislation also stipulates that the local law enforcement may gather no more information than is necessary to achieve the objective of the search and to impose other conditions and the use of search warrant or wiretap order and the information obtained, including retention and disclosure requirements. Information obtained in violation of these sub of these provisions would be inadmissible in criminal, civil, or administrative proceedings. So that's pretty good. So um, that's a good as a good start. It is great that they are trying to honor the Fourth Amendment, and um, I believe it's uh, Article One. I think it maybe Section Twelve of the California Constitution. I'm going to look that up right now. So definitely, all you folks in the Golden State, which. Uh, you know, I'm not too keen of that guy, Jerry Brown, and some of the lackeys you have, but that's okay. But the whole thing is this. Uh, you have to put their feet to the fire. And remember, you still got the power of the recall, so, um, so you can still don't let them screw you over, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, oh, yeah. Oh yeah, California Constitution Article 1, and um, it's very interesting here, let's just find out where this is at, to be exact, and this is, nope, it is not, it's my mistake on 12, Article 1, Section 13, of the California Constitution states the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable seizures and searches may not be violated, and a warrant may not issue except on probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons and things to be seized. So, this is equivalent to the Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. So, I am very pleased to uh to um see that and um you know it's gonna see i'm gonna check this out here i will definitely add that to my uh footnotes for you folks and because you have the right to know and that's why i must let's uh, see if it see what i can do here Uh-huh, let me just check this out. Bear with me. 
I'm not. Don't. I'm not gonna. I'm, I'm just gonna. Ooh, I made a mistake. Nah, wrong. Wrong one. Boop. That's okay. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna add that to the. Definitely gonna add that to um the memo. Put that in there. So you definitely look for Article One, Section Thirteen of the California Constitution, and we're gonna continue on. Continue on here. Local control. A second bill that works together with SB 178 to create a powerful one-two punch against the use of stingray devices passes both houses and legislature and will now head to the governor's desk. Senator Jerry Hill, Senator Joe Anderson, and uh, Senator Jerry Hill, Senator Joe Anderson, and Senator, Senator Mark Lano introduced SB 741 earlier this year. The bill prohibits a local agency from acquiring or using a steering device unless approved by a resolution or ordinance adopted by a legislation body at a regularly scheduled public meeting held, held pursuant to the Ralph M. Brown Act. Under the Act, residents must have an opportunity for public comment. Excellent. An assembly amendment to the legislation exempts county sheriffs. They only need to provide public notice before acquiring Stingray. They do not have to get local government approval. So so right there, there's that exemption. The sheriff is the most powerful person in the county. But but I'll say this. He's still a public servant to the particular municipalities or counties in that state. So I do recommend the sheriff to address this publicly okay and if people don't like it they can recall if you're gonna do it without the people's approval I say resign or get your butts recalled alright that will be that will be one thing I would recommend if that happens if this gets passed but I will proceed here the bill also requires a resolution or ordinance to set forth policies on stingrays based on specific guidelines outlined the legislation. So there are conditions. SB 74, 7, oh, 741 passed the assembly by a vote of 79 to 0. The Senate con- concurred with the assembly amendments 38 to 0, and the bill now goes to the governor's desk. Since local police generally receive these devices directly from the FBI or through grant money provided to them by the FBI, can we say blackmail? Passage of SB 741 allow local communities to interpose themselves in this process and blocks the FBI's programs for coming to fruition. So, so far as I'm concerned, our money's going to them and it's going back to going back to those uh, figureheads on a local level. <laughs> Tax dollars at work, right? All right, I will continue on here. Impact on federal surveillance programs. The federal government funds the vast majority of state and local stingray programs, attaching one more condition. The feds require agencies acquiring the technology to sign non disclosure agreements as alluded by the Tacoma police chief. This throws a giant shroud over the program, even preventing judges, prosecutors, and defense attorneys from getting information about the use of stingrays in court. The feds actually instruct prosecutors to withdraw evidence if judges or legislators press for information. The Baltimore Sun reported that last fall, a Baltimore detective refused to answer questions on the stand during a trial, citing a federal non-disclosure agreement. Hmm. Well, there go there goes your powers, my friends, in Baltimore, Maryland, and Tacoma, uh, at least Tacoma, Washington. Defense attorney Joshua Ensley asked Cabrera about the agreement. Does this document instruct you to withhold evidence from the state's attorneys and circuit court, even upon court order to produce? He asked. Yes, Cabrera says, as um, privacy pri- privacy sos dot org put it, the FBI would rather would rather police force police officers and prosecutors like criminals go than face a possible scenario where a defendant brings a Fourth Amendment challenge to the warrantless stingray spine. The Fed sales technology 
in the name of any terrorism efforts with non-disclosure, non-disclosure agreements in place. Most police, most police departments refuse to release any information on the use of stingrays, but information obtained from the Tacoma Police Department revealed that it uses technology primarily for routine criminal investigations. Some privacy advocates argue that the stingray could never can use can never happen within the perimeters of the Fourth Amendment because the technology necessarily connects to every electronic device within range, not just the one held by the target. So if you if you so I would tell all these folks here start talking crap and just be totally sarcastic and be fictitious on the phone if you if if you, if you see these certain towers. Just drive those vault peeping toms crazy all right and i will continue on here and um ooh, and the information collected by these devices undoubtedly ends up in the federal databases the feds can share and tap into vast amounts of information gathered at the state and local level though through a system known as the information sharing environment or s-i-s-e in other words, stingrays created potential for the federal government to track the movement of millions of millions of, Amer- of millions of Americans with no warrant, no probable cause, and without the people even knowing it. Yeah, Big Brother, 1984. Well, we'll hand, put our hands to critical. Big Brother, Big Brother, think for me. All right. According to his website, the ISE provides analysts, operators, and investigators. With information needed to enhance national security, these analysts, operators, and investigators have mission needs to collaborate and share information with each other and with private sector partners and our foreign allies. In other words, ISC serves as a conduit for sharing of information gathered without a warrant. The federal government encourage, encourages and funds stingrays at the state and local level across the U.S., thereby undoubtedly gaining access to a massive data pool on Americans without having to expend the resources to collect information itself. By placing restrictions on stingray use, state and local governments limit the data available that the feds can access. In a nutshell, without state or local cooperation, the feds have much more difficult time gathering information. This represents a major blow to the surveillance state and a win for privacy, parallel construction, by making information obtained in violation of the law admissible in court. SB... 178 would effectively stop one practical effect of NSA spying in California. Reuters reveal. Well, excuse me here. Reuters reveal the extent of such NSA data sharing with the state local law enforcement in August 2013 article according to documents obtained by its news agency. The NSA passes information to police through a formerly secret DEA unit known for special operations divisions and the case rarely involved with national security issues. Almost all the information involves regular investigators, criminal investigations, not terror-related investigations. In other words, not only does the NSA collect and store this data, using it to build profiles, the agency encourages the state and local law enforcement to violate the Fourth Amendment by making the use of this information in their day-to-day investigation. It is the most threatening situation of our constitutional republic since the Civil War, Van Biney said. So, the great thing about these bills, what they've done in California, is very good. I'm very pleased to hear about that. But you still got to remain vigilant. You guys try to, st- and I say, we'll try to find, try to blackmail some people in the local, state and local level. To try to get information. So um, there's one thing about these, about this is just the battle is going to be going to go forward. But definitely pay attention, counter these things. Remember, every high tech gadget has a flaw, including those stingrays. You know, you might have to get cases, might have to get cases to block uh, block their uh, tracking on you and all that. But um, like I said. Drive these guys crazy. That's how I look at it. So um, definitely, Mike, 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 Mary, Mahari, who wrote it, did a good job on it. 
and you can look at the links on there. I am I have added the California Constitution, Article One, Section Thirteen. Or just actually, look up Article One, Section Thirteen. Definitely uh, spread this information around, my friends. And uh, like I gotta say, that's a good job what California did. I'm I'm pretty critical, you know, on um, how they do things. So, um, but I am I gotta give them give them respect on that. So uh, definitely very pleased. Mm-hmm. Definitely very, very, very happy about that. So, um, uh, okay. Let's see here. Yeah, so uh, I apologize, my friends. I'm just, just a little bit keen right now. Sorry about that. All right, next one here came from the Gun Rider. Came out today. It was actually breaking news, by the way. And since it says here, Florida Carry Inc. sues FSU as president and police chief for preemption and violation. This is written by written by written by Lee Williams. It says here in these notes, these note, Florida Carry Inc. has sued Florida State University, the college president, and the campus police chief for violating the state preemption law which mandates that only the state legislator can regulate arms. Florida Carey is allegedly in a civil suit that even John Thrasher, president of the of the of Florida State University and FSU police chief David Perry as well are well aware of the law and by the decision of the court they have chosen continuing to illegally prohibiting the possession of firearms in people's private vehicles. Here the press release, September 8, 2015, Tallahassee, Florida. In 2014, then Senator Thrasher ad- admonished Florida Carey during legislative committee hearing for supporting of a pro-Second Amendment bill that corrects an unconstitutional infringement on the right to bear arms rather going to the courts and bringing a lawsuit. Today, Florida Carey... Florida Carey is taking his advice. Florida Carey joins FSC graduate student Bacall Hargrove of student Florida Students for Concealed Carry in a lawsuit filed today seeking an emergency injunction against John Thrasher, now president of Florida State University, the University and FSU Police Chief David Perry. In 2013, the Florida First District Court of Appeals made it crystal clear in case of the Florida Carey versus UNF or today, I think it's uh, University of North Florida, that universities have no authority to regulate the lawful possession of firearms that are property stored in private vehicles on campus, despite the fact that FSU and President Thrasher are well aware of the law and the binding decision of the court. They have chosen to continue illegally p- prohibiting the possession of firearms in people's private vehicles. Even though, even go so far to use their own police force to publicly threaten criminal enforcement of their unlawful regulations. Can we say we're going to enforce victimless crime laws? Hmm. <laughs> A recent release published by the FSU Police Department's instruct that weapons and or firearms are not permitted to be stored in vehicle in a vehicle on FS, FSU campus at any time, including game days. Emphasis in original. The FSU Game Day Plan 2015 New Info, which is links for that like light blue here, says here publication goes out. On to flouts the law of Florida State and that weapons are prohibited on the Florida State University campus at all times, including football games. Fans may not store farms or other weapons in their vehicles parked on campus while attending the games. Possession of a firearm or a weapon on the campus constitutes a felony and violators are subject to arrest and pursuant to Florida Statue 790 
1.115. And it's interesting because I got the, um, I got the link to that law on that. So, um, pretty bone chilling. No, I don't say bone chilling. And um, it's, it says right here. Possessing or discharging weapons of or firearms at a school sponsored event or on school property prohibited penalties exceptions. So it's interesting what it says here about these laws is this um probably pretty cockeyed in some ways. And like it says here on um uh, subsection one it says possessing or discharging firearms yeah, penalties exceptions it says, subsection one, a person who exhibits any sword Sword, cane, firearm, electric weapons, or device, destructive device, or other weapon as defined in st- on Statute 790.001, Subsection 13, including a razor blade, box cutter, or common pocket knife, except as authorized in support of a school sanctioned activities in the presence of one or more persons in a rude, careless, angry, or threatening manner. And not in lawful self-defense at a school-sponsored event or on grounds or facilities of any school, school bus, or school bus stop within a thousand feet of the real property that comprises a public or private elementary school, middle school, or secondary school during school hours during the time of a sanctioned school activity commits a felony of the third degree as provided in Florida Statutes 775.082, 775.083, or 775.084. This subsection does not apply to the exhibition of a firearm or weapon on private property real within 1,000 feet of a school by the owner of such property or by a person present of such property has been authorized, licensed, or invite by the owner. Okay, so it, so if, if, if it's done in bad faith, okay, okay, or criminal intent, then that's a different, see, that's a different ball game. But if you peacefully have it, that's, you know, something you got to really look at, all right? And let's go here with, uh, with, um, subsection 2A. A person shall not possess any firearms, electric weapon or device, destructive device or other weapon as defined in section 790.001, subsection 13, including a razor blade, a box cutter, except as authorized in the school, as in support of school sanctioned activities at a school sponsored event or on a property of any school, school bus or school bus stop. However, a person may carry a firearm. However, a person may carry a firearm. Okay, so um, this is pretty this is interesting here. Let's go here. One, in case a two firearms program class or functions have been approved by advanced principal. Okay, it talks about that. If they have a shooting range, that's number two. And number three, in the vehicle pursuant to 790.25, subsection 5, except the school restrictions may adopt written or published policies that with the exception in the subparagraph for purposes of students and campus public privileges. So, so right there, they may get you, but hold, the whole thing is, hold, the whole thing is, is, um, it's interesting, but we can go a little bit further down as well, like um, in this other area, it, which is uh, let me see. Oh, sorry about that. Doesn't here for purpose of the section schools. All right, that's no big deal. But the whole thing is like if it's for criminal intent, yeah. And I like where it says here, number two, which is like in the bottom of C1, or subsection, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, 2C, yeah, subsection, that's the same thing, 2C, number two, and it says here, person who stores or leaves a loaded firearm within the reach or easy access of a minor, okay, that's like another thing, but the, you know, but the whole, but the whole thing is, if it's mainly for criminal intent, you know, so, um, but if you have a possession and so forth in your vehicle, you know, 
It's like, except the school district may adopt written and published policies. So, right there, let's just check that out. Let's see, see what it says here. 790.25. There's a link for that. Lawful ownership using firearms or other weapons. So, declaration of policy use not authorized. Lawful use, okay. So, like it says here, there are lawful ownership, use of firearm and other weapons. So, it's interesting right there. On, um, oops, on that, on that section. Okay, we're at 79.25. It's for lawful purposes. And so, uh, what they're trying to say is... They're trying to say, if you're a lawful person, they can arrest you under 790.115. <laughs> so right there, you, then technically, they have, con they may, I, I'm pretty convinced they may have, I'm convinced they have contradicted themselves. You know, it's mostly for criminal intent only. So, and, um, so right there, they have goofed on that. They have goofed. So right there, they just got, they just right there, they just like totally got that screwed up. All right, so I'm going to leave that, sec uh, I'm going to leave that on there, um, chapter 790.115. And there's links for that too. You can even hit the 79.25. And I'll tell you all about it. So, um, but it is funny, yeah. It is, fun. it is very interesting. So right there, they may have, it uh, looks like FSU can't, the, F, the FSU representatives have put their foot in their mouth, I would say. So, we'll continue on here. The FSU Student Code of Conduct also attempts to enforce these illegal policies by prohibiting on all campus possession. Of these are firearms with the exception for firearm possession in a private vehicle and even off campus or unauthorized possession or the use of a firearm. It has a trillion effect on the right to bear arms when law abiding gun owners are lied to by public officials, especially ones who control their own police forces and are told that they will be breaking a law by the possession of their legal firearms. Sean Carena, Executive Order of Florida Carry Inc. These publications are a blatant attempt by FSU President Thrasher and his anti-Second Amendment employees to enforce illegal gun control with the threat of throwing good people in jail for unlawful exercise to the right to bear arms. We demand that public officials follow the law and will stand nothing for less. They are, you know, Florida Carry is a non-profit organization and um, I am very pleased that they are taking these bastards to court because the whole thing is this my friends they want to punish you for lawfully owning a firearm in your vehicle as long as you don't flaunt it harass or th using any threatening activities or other words criminal intent but they want to say if you have it peacefully and they'll arrest you under 790.115 and you know what that is a penile microphone rhetoric that means they're mumbling to you don't even know the damn law and i have add that in there just to let you know that that section where well, I addressed aforementioned, and there's links all light blue colors, and you can look through all the other statues there as well. And I can you can ask this to Mr. John Thrasher and Police Chief David Barry. Are the campus police obligated to protect me as an individual? You know what? It is no way no how because they are under sovereign immunity and liability tort statute so um definitely i'm going to add that to my to those footnotes as well with the other chapter because you are entitled to know about it on the florida statue sovereign immunity tort liability
I think I spelled sovereign wrong. Yes, I have. Oops. That's okay. But that is the whole thing, my friend. You have to really look at that. And that's under the photo statue 768.28. So I'm definitely going to add that to my footnotes. And you can look up Wong versus the city of Miami. All right, in 1970. So I'm definitely going to add those two footnotes in there on both those statues because you know why? You have the right to know regardless. So um, definitely get that, check that out. So um, I'm going to do a little pause here, so bear with me. All right, enough for that. Next one here came from PNAC, all right, which it stands for Photography is Not a Crime. This is, um, came out today, for me exact, yeah, but it's by Carlos Miller. This one's entitled Baltimore Agrees to Set Up with Freddie Gray's Family for $6.4 million. And is it, I'm um, like, mind boggled here and it says city of baltimore has reached settlement agreement with freddie gray's family for 6.4 million dollars an astronomical figure considering the beleaguered department has paid about 7.5 million dollars in police abuse settlements in more than 40 cases during a three-year period the settlement is also noteworthy considering gray's family had not filed a lawsuit interesting the settlement needs to be approved by the city boards of estimates, the governing body that oversees city spending, according to the Baltimore Sun. Gray was a 25-year-old man who died in the back of a Baltimore police van in April, sparking protest riots and further national scrutiny on police abuse. The last time he was seen alive was a citizen named Kevin Moore who video recorded who video recorded police dragging a handcuff and screaming Gray in the back of the van. It was then report that Gray was not strapped in, so it is believed the officers purposely drove recklessly, causing him to fling around the back of the van, and his head ended up smashing against a bolt on the back on the back door. Six officers Caesar Gooden Goodson, Garrett Miller, Edward Nero, William Porter, Alicia White, and Brian Brian Rice were charged in his death and are still awaiting trial on charges ranging from murder to assault all have pleaded not guilty last week a judge ruled that the officers will be given separate trials this week a judge will determine if the trials will be held in Baltimore or in another jurisdiction last year even before Freddie Gray incidents cast a spotlight on the Baltimore Police Department, the Baltimore Sun published an investigative report detailing several cases of excessive force on citizens who end up clear on all criminal charges as well as receiving monetary settlements which diverted money from community projects, such beings in which the victims are most often African Americans, they carry a hefty cost, they can poison relationships between police and the community, limiting the cooperation in the fight against crime. The mayor and police officials say they also diverted money in the city budget. The $5.7 million in taxpayer funds paid out since January 2011 would cover the price of the state-of-the-art rec, rec center and renovations of, at more than 30 playgrounds. And it doesn't count the $5.8 million spent on the city legal fees to defend these claims brought against police. <laughs> Good grief. While settlements may cost the city and the taxpayers money, they relieve officers from the from admitting wrongdoing. That's exactly the case in the Gray settlement. The city is accepting all civil liability in Gray's arrest and death, but does not acknowledge any wrongdoing by the police, according to a statement from Rawlings Blake's administration. The proposed settlement agreement going before the Board of Estimates should not be interpreted as a judgment on guilt or innocence of the, or the, officer, of the officers facing trial, the mayor said in a statement. This settlement is being proposed solely because it is the best interest of the city and avoids costly and 
protract litigation that would only make it more difficult for our city to heal and potentially cost taxpayers many millions more in damage. The mayor's office declined to answer questions about the settlement, including why it was brought to the spending panel before any lawsuit was filed. Under the proposed settlement, the city would pay $2.8 million during the current fiscal year and $3.6 million next year, as the city said. By entering into a settlement, the city would avoid a public lawsuit that could have played out in court. In such settlements, a clause has to have both sides cannot talk publicly about the case. Prior to the Gray settlement, only six settlements exceeding $200,000 since 2011, and those came after months of legal wrangling. But those cases did not capture the nation's attention as it once did. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, so City C would love to settle, 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 settle. Like I said, City of Baltimore knows best by using other people's money, the taxpayers. Very real shame on what's hap- what happened. And it's interesting. Remember, it says here, you got three men, no, six men, no, no six people, five men, one woman, one woman, three men were white, and you got three. You got five men. Uh, uh, three of them are white. The other three are black. Hey, at least you're white. Yep, a female, a woman. Oh my goodness, we can't say racism, but the whole thing is, is some strange relationships is happening over there. A lot of friction was going on, and they still have a right to have a fair trial. Even if it's outside of Baltimore, which is guaranteed by the Sixth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. And even their fair trial statutes in the, in the Maryland Constitution as well. And this is how, that's how things happen. So, the video may say one thing and all that, but we don't know the whole entire story. But one young man passed, which is a shame. I know he had rough edges, and he had some past past uh, history and it's a shame I'm going to be critical like I said he got what he deserved but I can't make those actual judgments but if he did wrong in the past yeah I'll disagree I will criticize him on his actions but um, this is just happening in a lot of places and it's not just the black person that died a victim, the only black victim it's a little bit more than that. It's affecting everybody. And that's a real shame. But one thing I got, I do have to admire is the city, the, bottom, the people who live in Baltimore was trying to keep the peace, the residents did. And I give the, well, those guys respect or homage for what you've done. But like I said, they have a, they have a right to a fair trial like everybody else. And let's see how far this goes. And hopefully, even they get, if they get acquitted, if they get acquitted, don't destroy your neighborhoods and watch out for those outsiders, because they love to take advantage of morose opportunities or angry anger opportunities. It'll take a while, but the people in Baltimore have to be patient. I'm still critical with their ma- with that with their mayor, Rico woman. You could tell I said so. I don't care. <laughs> but um, it's gotta let the chips fall, and let the chips fall, and just uh, follow your hearts, stand up for what's right. Oh yeah, sorry about that. Next one here came from. Activist post actually came out yesterday, September 7th, on Labor Day. And it says here, American Dream, brought to you by Edward Bernays. Bernays. It's by Melissa Dykes. It says here, comedian George Carlin famously said, 
You don't have to be asleep to believe it. The concept of the American dream which seems to be a relic of the Cold War is hammered into our heads from childhood and constantly thrown in our, in our faces by politicians even today. It's always defined in this grand idea that the game is not any way rigged. Oh no, it is instead beat, us, beat into us Americans from the time we are very little that a little elbow grease. Any of us can be anything we want to be in this country, regardless of what circumstances find ourselves born, and simply because, well, this is America. It is so trite, it is kind of hard to make myself type that. For clarification, here's what, here's what Wikipedia says. The American dream is a national ethos of the United States. Instead of ideas in which freedom includes the opportunity for prosperity and success and an upward social mobility for the family and children achieved through the hard work in society with few barriers. But these days we aren't talking about basic ideas of personal success that allow people to be free with and with few barriers. No one seems to remember what freedom is anymore. Around here anyway. Excuse me here. And personal success has been warped into prison sentence for most. Freedom has long ago been replaced by a prison with invisible walls. Most people today equate the modern American dream with the ability to receive higher education, usually by going to college, so they can get a good paying job to buy a nice big house filled with nice stuff, a fancy car, and have the ability to go on vacation once or twice a year. In other words, rising the ranks in America to achieve that dream ultimately equals consumerism, complete with lots and lots of debt. For most young people who don't have wealthy parents, what it really means is attempting to get all the scholarships you can throughout high school because otherwise you and your parents will be stuck. It's shouldering an automatically life-killing amount of student loan debt right off the bat to just get through college. The college tuition is also rising here. America's loan debt is over $1.2 trillion. These days, the economy is I like to speculate all the time on whether or not this will be the next bubble to burst. So you can't, you, but so just to get your feet in the American dream door today, you've got to pay the play. The game is rigged. Once these early 20-something graduates from college, again, many already drowned in debt. They get thoughtlessly tossed in a pool of applicants who are just as qualified as they are to get A few measly good jobs that are left, considering that many of the jobs that people use to rely on this post-war America to fulfill that dream has been shipped off to China or Mexico or India. Can we see outsourcing? Our unemployment numbers are fudge because so many people have fallen completely out of the workforce and given up looking for a job aren't even counted. Nearly 100 million adults who can otherwise work simply aren't in this country because they have no options. Labor force participation is near at a near 40 year low and time you to get out, go out to eat. Ask your widow riches how many college degrees he or she has. Sometimes it's two, but slinging plates was the only option to be able to make ends meet because that degree that costs tens of thousands to get a dime a dozen to employers. And that's how many young adults begin their road to the American dream. We are told it's possible for everyone to achieve these days. Meanwhile, the wealth gap has grown so wide in this country, it's a joke to even refer it to a, as a gap anymore. Perhaps wealth chasm would be more appropriate. And it isn't just here. We live in a world just perhaps seven people have much as wealth as the poorest 3.5 billion in the world. It's mind-blowing. Headlines like panic super rich buying boat holes with private airships to escape if poor rises up. 
come out, come out all the time. There's something very wrong, and everyone knows it. Here in America, a mere 10% of Americans own 91% of the nation's stock and mutual funds. Those people are, son are the same ones essentially running everything. America is merely an oligarchy. A new study has confirmed that the preference of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. Your opinion only matters in, pu in public if you are in the top 10%. Corruption is legal in America. Pu political influence is a commodity. The game is rigged. The rules are made up by the elite. And the point points don't matter. Meanwhile, back to the reality of the rest of, of us faith. For out of five Americans are barely making ends meet each month. Number of people receiving food stamp benefits over 47 million is at a historic high. The benefits of big banks like J.P. Morgan, Chase, and mega companies like Walmart. The middle class has been systematically decimated. Hardly anyone is buying a house anymore. We're becoming a nation of renters with Wall Street as our landlord. If the average person wanted to get that house and car and vacation, what most would have to take out a loan, another loan, and a few credit cards with ridiculous interest rates no one can afford. Driving out down what's left of America's middle class street it is impossible not to look upon the nicely manicured lawns and wonder how much debt that people have taken on just to make their American dream a fleeting reality. Our economy is based on indoctrinated children. Yes, no matter how rigged the game is, children continue to be raised brainwashed with the American dream generation after generation. Out of curiosity, and because the whole thing sounds like such a Bernadian concept of bullshittery to begin with, I looked into where the concept of the American dream comes from. When did it start? Who first started pulling this one on the public? According to a lesson plan for teachers of the official Library of Congress website, featuring a picture of the Statue of Liberty for extra emphasis. The American Dream was defined in 1931 by James Truslow Adams in his book, The Epic of America, as that dream of land in which life should be better and richer and fuller for everyone, with opportunity for each according to ability or achievement. It is not a dream of motor cars and high wages merely, but a dream of social order with each man and each woman shall be able to attain the fullest stature of which they are innately capable, can be recognized by others for what they are, regardless of the fortuitous circumstances of birth or position. This is from pages two, page 214 to 215 if you want to check the book out. Wait, what? Not a dream of motor cars and higher wages merely? Oh, really? Is that what we are? Teaching kids in our public schools in America is the exact opposite of the reality they come to understand? What? what, what why is that? Well, Edward Benet's nephew of Sigmund Freud and father of public relations who literally wrote the book Propaganda and never met a government agency or mega corporation whose agenda he couldn't pay to advance. Ooh. Sorry about that. It merely came to mind when it contrasts the concept of the American dream today against the reality we the people are currently facing. For a little background on Bernays's Bernays, let's start with the final statement in his book, Propaganda. And I think there's a blue link here, so let's check it out. Let's see what it says here. Uh, from Amazon. Okay, you get an Amazon. 
And it says here, The conscious and intelligence manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in a democratic society. Those who manipulate the unseen mechanism of society constitute an available government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. It is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together as a smoothly functioning society. Interesting there, huh? And I will say this, because I will continue on. With what? One moment. Sorry about that. It says here. With what? It becomes pretty obvious with the whole social engineering. The American masses with this concept of the American dream will play in churning out the smoothly functioning society Bernays talked about. And as it turns out, ever Bernays decided... Bernays hijacked the American dream and weaponized it for the U.S. government after World War II. At the end of World War... At the end of World War II... Henry Truman had a dilemma on his hands. The the economy had come back from the Great Depression during the war. He wanted the economy to continue to grow during peacetime as well. So he conferred with experts, including Bernays, to come up with a plan to to call it to happen. The plan, the plan the marketers created was called the American Dream. The dream involved the breadwine, breadwinner, typically the man, to be working in a job that he didn't really love and to work longer and longer hours to climb the corporate ladder in order to make money. His family would need to create a high consumerism lifestyle required to keep the economy growing in peacetime. Consumers were being influenced to buy more things in companies were being encouraged to produce more products that nobody really needed in order to keep the economy going well. See where this is going yet? Well, it's going here. But no matter how many hours a man worked, there still wasn't enough money to purchase all of the stuff. So naturally, consumer debt began to skyrocket. First, the credit cards emerged. Society experienced a com conformance crisis during the 1950s that nationality began the hijacking of our happiness due to manufactured consent using the tactic of, you guessed it, Edward Bernays. Hmm. Interesting there. I could continue on. The marketing version of the American dream was complete contradiction to the country's original American dream, which had a pursuit of happiness as an am- chemi- chemical goal and personal freedom, social responsibility, and the common good. It was a 1950s convulsion that still holds America and much of the world in its grip is excessive consumerism. So excessive consumerism became the definition of happiness. Materialism is the pursuit of happiness. That's how the Bernays manipulate the people. What is public relations? Brainwash us. Think this. Think that. When to wipe your behind. And that's it. And there you have it. That's what one person wrote on here. The pursuit of happiness and freedom. That was one of the American dreams transformed into a nightmare of lifelong debt, slavery, and filling one's life with things we don't need merely to keep American machine going. Consider that next time you hear the insulting phrase that oozes out of another brought, bought and paid for politicians in the mouth in one of his BS speeches. And it says here, um, it's by Melissa Dykes, formerly Melton, is a co-founder of TruthMedia.com. She has an experienced researcher, graphic arts, professor, of journalist, a passion, liberty, and dedication to truth. Her aim is to expose the new world order for what it is, a prison for human soul, which we must break free. There's a video on here about the hijack David Groder, text, 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 and Sinia. And that's like the whole thing, this 
lot of mind control 101. And if you read the book Propaganda by Ed Benes, you can really figure out things pretty confoundly quick. I've read it. It's incredible. And got me thinking a lot more broader. And I'm going to promise here... I am going to add Ed Bernays' book, Propaganda, which is on a PDF format. And I will add this to my footnotes with this and everything I'm going to be addressing on my, to my Spreaker page. So, but this is really interesting with Ed Bernays. And if you read this book, you could maybe you can know the enemy, what he's, the brainwasher. It's like him, the Jim Joneses and all that use that same method, okay? When you really contemplate it. The whole world's a stage, my friends. So, um, this is a real. Oops, hold on here. Really interesting, yeah? And what is uh, concurring? So, um, oops, I gotta head back here, made that mistake. So, um, definitely check it out. And I'm gonna add propaganda again in my footnotes. And finally, I got this, you know, um, from a good colleague of mine, a good friend of mine, from, from a front man from Crow Mags, John Joseph. He sent this on his Facebook page. I read it, and it's really fantastic. I think everyone should need to know. Read, check this out. This is from ForksOverKnives.com, and this is a success story. And it says here, this is entitled, How I Lost 225 Pounds, Ditched My Meds, and Reclaimed My Life. It's by a gentleman named Millen Ross. And I gotta say, I see the before and after photos. He looks fantastic. And I have to give him the thumbs up on that. And it's Reese here. Oops. Out of the way. This is where we had this is the story. It says here I was trapped in a morbidly obese body for 18 years. I was six foot four and 518 pounds at my heaviest, and I struggled with secret depression, Agnes, Angus, and despair. On the outside, I was a jokester, but inside, I felt hopeless about my health. I didn't believe that I could do anything to change my body, and I woke up every morning feeling trapped in my body tomb. In June 2013, my moment of truth. In June of 2013, my wife Iris and I decided to take our 60-year-old son Nigel to Universal Studio, University, Universal Orlando theme park in Florida for a trip of a lifetime. The one thing my son requested repeatedly was to ride the Harry Potter ride with me, which he felt would be the most epic ride of the week. I promised him that wild horses could not stop me from riding with him, though in the back of my mind I worried that my 420 pound size could be an issue. We, f- we arrived in Ivory before the park opened to be the front of the Harry Potter line. As we approached the platform, a runner operator asked me to try the sample seating to see if I'd fit. He could get me into the, if he couldn't get me into the harness, so he asked a co-worker to help him. As the two men practically broke my ribs trying to close the harness, I realized I was not be, uh, I'm not going to be able to ride with my son. As I stepped out of the line into the waiting area, my son immediately started to cry. He begged the ride operator, please let my dad ride with me. It's my birthday. I was devastated. As the tears began to flow freely down my face, I promised myself this would be the last time I would let my son not let would let last time I would let my son da- my son down because of my size. In October 2013, Whole Foods Immersion Program. I worked for Whole Food Markets, and I, and I had heard about an immersion program they offered as a health benefit to all full-time employees. Even though I didn't fully understand what it was, I applied for and was accepted into Dr. Stoll's immersion program. As soon as I returned home, I was excited to go on an all-expense-paid tropical vacation to a five-star resort. I pretty much figured it Figured, figured that I'd be, it be an adult fat camp. I made myself one vow. I say, I, I saw any results from the week. I com, I committed to the program they taught me. 
It was powerful, life-changing week. I was introduced to a plant-based diet for the first time. Although the first couple of days of detox from caffeine, oil, salt, and animal products were super rough, it was an empowering experience to get it through. Get through it. By the end of the week, I had I had lost 33 pounds and full six inches of my waist for the first time I realized there's a way out of the hell I had been living for nearly two decades returning to the real world within three months I was down over 70 pounds and off all meds the diabetic neuropathy in my feet was gone the melagia Prasidia. Sorry about that. <laughs> Oops. That was funny. I'm sorry, my friends. Okay. Heard some commercial <laughs> I'm on my on the line. But, um, magical parasitia. I hope I. Parasitia. That's the. That's the. Ah. Parasitica. Constant burning thigh pain was gone. My blood pressure cons- cons- consistently read 100 over 72, lower than I was on hypertension meds. It was, I was also off of all caffeine and was started to see what the real freedom, what real freedom looked like. After six months after the immersion, I had lost 107 pounds without really trying. Too big to do any exercises. I walked. 15 to 30 minutes slowly on the treadmill and took short bike rides, even though I was starting to look and feel like a completely different person before the emergent. I had been 53 pounds body fat, more fat than me. I was starting to emerge and began to share my story with everyone I could. And there's a photo of him before and after. He become a full flavor vegan or plant-based, but some people like to say, which is awesome. You know, he does look really, really great. And um, it says here, living fully and freely today. Now, less than two years after Dr. Stoll's immersion, I'm down to 225 pounds to 190. I look 15 years younger. My skin looks great, and I no longer need alert allergy medicine. When I first came home from the immersion program, I could barely bike the two Point five hilly miles to Whole Foods in three hours. Now I do it in seven minutes in traffic. I still eat a lot every few hours, but now I really enjoy what I'm eating and actually feel going at good afterward. Some of my favorite meals are potato leek soup, curried lentils, grilled pineapple, steel cut oatmeal with peanut butter and fruit. I eat the biggest salad and I want then always eat my lunch and dinner after that. <laughs> my health affects more than just me. After I, had, after I had lost most of the weight, my son opened up to me and shared how other uh, how how the other kids used to tease him when I when I picked them up from school. And now he didn't like that I sat in the chair when we play catch. I knew that my health affected every aspect of my life, but I hadn't thought much before that day as the Universal Show has also affected the lives of people and the people who love me. I still get choked about choked up when I think about it. The average person doesn't understand what it's like to be very obese. Grounded from life, forced to live on the sidelines, is my hope that be sharing my most vulnerable moments. I can help others. I've made it my life, mission, my life's mission to help as many people as I can to make it out the struggle of obesity. Please see see my before and after photos. I think somehow I am special, but I am. The most ordinary person on the planet. I don't have super willpower, nor I'm a, I'm a, I'm a chef. I a chef. If I can do it, anyone can. The best part is that it doesn't have to take a lifetime. And he, I have to say, the photos are amazing. He looks great. And um, it is Mylon Mylon Ross. He's now working on a book with Dr. Scott Tall, Stahl, which will be out early 2016. So um, definitely check it out. 
Definitely. But um, I have to say, he looks really good, and um, I'm very proud of him. And the whole thing is, my friends, I'm not a plant-based person. I love vegetables and all that. I still eat meat now and then. The whole thing is, we got to break out the processed foods and just cleanse our, clean, clean our soul, clean our, clean our bodies out. Cause, and, and this is just an example what this man achieved. And his son is very happy. I can see the photo. He's very happy. And um, it's touching. You can do anything you can achieve. That's what the message of this uh, article is really about. And um, anyone can do it. A- anyone who's listened to the show that has these weight issues, go to ForkOverKnives.com. I will add this link to everything I'm, I address. I'm going to add footnotes, my footnotes on my Spreaker page. Share it. Spread this information around because, like I said, all that crap we see in the, in the grocery stores, the GMO products, the high fructose corn syrup, it's time for you, for us to take a stand. It needs us more. We need them. To us, that's a want, not a need. So definitely get inspired. Whatever you do, never surrender because we only live once. Let's value it. If we and we get, if we have those achieving, achieving, we achieve our goals. Share it with others. Become the rabbi of your past history because it's today's greatest teacher. And like I said, this is a real awesome article. So please. Send this to everyone you know. And that is it, my friends. I'd like to thank everyone for listening to this episode. Plus, feel free to download and share this throughout your social media network. If you have any questions, comments, love letters, hate letters, criticism, it's okay, or compliments. Or if you have uh, something interesting that you want to send me, please feel free to do so. But always use your comments with decorum. You can hit me on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Spreaker, send your comments to iHeartRadio, or YouTube, Loki Luck 3. Or Email me at lookalook3 at gmail.com. Once again, thanks for your time. Thank you for your time. Mike tongue twister today. It's okay. <laughs> Plus, always remember that demoniac resistance is healthy for the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Keep on spreading the love and may your guardian spirits be with you.